I, I've been a follower and really an admirer of Bill's work and uh, a lot of the work that's, that his students have been doing for a long time. But look at this room. I'm like so impressed. It's after dinner. It's on a cold winter night. Look how many people are here. Like you're right. This is a serious, serious issue. It's a complicated issue. I'm so glad that you have come to hear some of the things that are going on over the course of this um, Open Classroom series, which is just remarkable. You've got some amazing people coming up next. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled with uh, Doug, what you've done, Matthias, the work that you've done put together. This list is amazing. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that is going on in the states, in the regions. Um, I'll talk a little tiny bit about the cities, although there's quite a bit going on there as well. Um, and about the governance issue, which is, you know, how do we actually manage this? How do we grapple with this extremely complicated issue um, with the variety of different kinds of uh, government structures that there are? And you've got somebody coming to speak to you. I think it's on the 30th, Jay Jacoby from MIT. And he, um, I, I heard him several times. Oh, it's not, it's not showing. Yeah, it's not showing. I can see it, but you guys can. Um, can everyone hear Sonia in the back? Can you? Can you hear it? Not so great? Ted, not so great up there? <laughs> All right, I'll try. I'll speak louder into here. Is that better? Good? Yes. Yeah, okay. Just remind me if I start to flag. Um, so uh, Jake Jacoby, who's coming to speak here in this series a little later on, I, I've heard say several times something that I cannot reproduce exactly, but I'll do my best, and you can ask him to say it for you later. But he basically says, you know, sort of, if you were going to design a program that was the, or, or a problem, that was the most difficult problem to solve, and, and you were going to sort of custom design it, what would you include? You'd make it be something that um, was, you couldn't taste or smell, you couldn't, oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> How is that possible? It's great music that's going on forever. I swear my phone is off. I don't know. Um, the um, uh, you design a you design a problem with a, you know with, with, with something you couldn't taste or smell um, that was not governed by any uh, single government that requires everyone to participate in its solution um, where the impacts uh, today don't affect the people who are who are causing the problem today that the impacts actually don't show up for well at the time we thought it was 50 years but in fact it's probably much less than that we're seeing the impacts now. Um, so there'd be a there'd be a delay in, in when you'd actually see the impacts, um, and he go, kind of goes on to list all these different characteristics that are true of the climate problem, and he says, why are we why are we surprised that this is so very very difficult to change? Um, it's it includes embedded benefits to um, no one you know no one sees right now kind of what their benefits would be, and yet the people that own coal and oil certainly see what the drawbacks are for them of stopping to burn those those products that they already own. And so on. Um, ask him for the exact quote, but I think it's just, it's really true. This is an incredibly <coughs> difficult problem to govern, and it re requires creative solutions. It requires new solutions, things we haven't done before, and it requires looking at where the positives are. Because as Bill said, there are many positives to the solutions that we're going to be talking about. There's just not somebody there today who's making money from doing it, but there will be. So um, what I want to cover quickly are sort of what are the challenges and the realities of trying to govern this problem? and who's doing it, and who's thought about it, and who's been successful at doing it. I'm going to focus on, I'm going to talk a little bit about the federal level, because there certainly are things happening in the federal agencies that are good, but it's not a comprehensive strategy there. And in fact, every time that Congress goes to try and put something in place, they're prohibited or lobbied against or somehow fail to, to reach it. And yet, at the state level, there's an awful lot happening. Um, and I'm going to go through, I think, a surprising amount of programs and policies and um, initiatives that are happening at the state level and at the regional level. We'll talk about those. And then, you know, the question is, I think, at the end of the day, are we kind of creating a federal program from the bottom up where it's happening in a lot of different places and at some point you can connect that fabric and create a real federal program? And do we even need one if it's working otherwise? So what, what's the options for the next, for the next four years? Um, what do we mean by governance? Like, that was the title of this, and just to, to give you a sense of it, what is it? Um, just basically, it's the kind of evolution of some kind of a cohesive set of policies and programs. 
So, you know, are we just taking various shots in the dark at low hanging fruit, or is there some kind of approach that is more comprehensive that will actually solve the problem? Um, and, you know, what is it that sort of a set of, of administrative and process oriented things that are going to get us there? So, I have mixed results to give you on this. I, I would not say that we have any kind of a comprehensive governance system within the states. I would not say that we are getting there. Uh, you know, it's not, it, it would be um, overly optimistic to say, and I'm sort of cutting to the chase, I'm going to say at the end, but you know, it would be overly optimistic to say that the states have it all handled and don't worry about it. That's absolutely not the case. But what is the case is that a lot of programs are being done right now that are setting models, protocols, examples of things that are working, that are costing less, that people like, that are bringing new money into the states, that are creating jobs, and that's what the focus of, of this is going to be. Um, at the end of the day, I think it is it is a global problem, and it does require bigger solutions than we're going to be able to gin up with at the state level. But I think that because the location of greenhouse gases doesn't really matter, you know, it's, it's not like other pollutants where it matters very much that it happens in one place or another, and there are thousands of sources, and frankly, thousands of solutions. Um, when the states look at putting, or anyone looks at putting a climate plan together, um, it, you know, often we're talking about something like 80, 100, 120 different programs, policies, and measures to begin to really get to, towards the goals. We require changes at a very broad number of places in, the, in our economy because we use energy every place across the economy. And so what we're looking for are big and systemic um, solutions where possible. I want to show you sort of the overview just to give you some pictures. I'm going to run through a lot of pictures. You don't have to get every number. Um, I'm trying to just give you the, the, big, the big picture of what the problem is, just in case some of you weren't at an earlier session where you heard the kind of description of the problem. Um, just to say that big red wedge is electricity generation, so that's the power plants that you know, we have throughout our country. Um, the smaller aqua-colored one is the transportation sector. It's about a third of the problem. These are, these are U.S. numbers, U.S. wide. Industry, which often is the, um, the place, the sector that you hear complaining the, you know, very bitterly about having to do anything on climate change, is about 20% of the problem. About 8% is agriculture, and then buildings, uh, residential and commercial buildings are, are the major. Um, this always, how you divide this up ends up being problems. Obviously, buildings use electricity, so that's not all that is. That's heating and cooling for buildings. Um, what I, I just wanted to say is that sort of over half of the oil used in the U.S. So back to that trans. Let me go back up to that slide just for a second. Um, over half of the oil use here. I, I'm sort of amazed. Um, that green wedge. When we're talking about benefits, that green wedge is basically oil imports. And oil imports are about six million dollars. Be right. Six million dollars an hour that we spend across the whole country to be importing foreign oil. Doesn't seem possible, but. One of the big goals is really to reduce oil consumption. That comes with new money back into the economy. So you know, as we start to look at different places where we're putting, where there are benefits, where, where good things are happening, where we're putting um, things back in, um, you know, that's one of the places that we can begin to save a lot of money um, and also to save the billions of dollars we spend every year, somewhere between 55 and $100 billion a year that we spend to defend that oil that we're bringing in. So, um, you know, that's one of the places to look for, for opportunities um, to, to have benefits. This um, is just to give you a sense of kind of where we are compared to other countries. So that, um, uh, this, well, kind of complicated. This, this is what, this is our emissions across populations. So uh, it's essentially what, it's, like, it's almost like a per capita chart, but it also includes total amounts. Um, but when the conversation that, that um, Bill was having before about having development, developed countries be involved in uh, making equivalent reductions when you begin to look at their per capita re, you know, emissions, they're actually quite low. Um, our per capita emissions, the first, that first bar is, um, that aqua bar is the US and Canada, and our per capita emissions are much higher than anybody else's. This is one of those charts. I'm not asking you to read it. I'm gonna show it to you. There are two charts like this in here. This will be in the, in the materials that you're going to get, and I just am putting this up there because at the end of the day, this chart helps me so much to understand the problem. 
<laughs> don't bother worrying about what's exactly in here. I'm giving this to you as a resource in your packet, but I want to show it to you. On the, on the left-hand side are all the big major sectors. So the ones I just showed you that were the wedges, transportation, electricity and heat, uh, fuel combustion, industry, um, and then some bunch of industrial processes, sort of the blue line, um, and agriculture. Uh, that's what, those are the sectors that are using energy. And then you begin to process those through the system and look at uh, where the end use is. So what Bill was just talking about, where you actually use it. Do you use it to provide light? Do you, what, what's the service that you want? Move people, light buildings, heat places. Um, that middle column is all of the actual services that we use. And then the one on the right is, what's the pollution problem at the end of it? The big kind of pinkish, I don't know, mauve, I guess, one color is, is CO2, is carbon dioxide. And that's the big thing that we talk about it being the problem. There are also other other pieces, methane, um, nitrogen oxides, and um, some very highly warming gases, but that's in relationship to how, how much of a problem they are. Um, so just know that you have this, I use this chart all the time when I get really confused about kind of what the problem is and what the solution is. I'm a nerd. If you don't want to use it, don't use it. It's fine with me. Um, but at least you have it. And it is actually, it's funny because I just find it very helpful. Um, and then this is total emissions. Uh, from 1990 to 2005 for the U.S. by, by type of, um, of uh, uh, emission, by type of pollution. And the big black bar is carbon dioxide. The next one up is methane, that's natural gas, which is a problem. It's very, very warming gas, 21 times more warming per molecule than, um, than carbon dioxide is. We lose a, quite a bit of it in transmission in the system. It's, probably seen the recent studies of Boston where we're about the worst place because we have one of the oldest natural gas uh, systems going. Um, so we lose a lot of natural gas. Uh, there are a few other pollutants as well, but CO2 is really big. Um, so basically on the, at the federal level, you know, there's no real carbon regulation right now. Everything's failed. The carbon cap at the national level has failed. Um, there was momentum for a while, it disintegrated. Uh, a number of runs have been taken at it right now. I can't say that there's anything that looks like really promising. I don't know if anybody wants to argue with me, but I don't see anything promising in, in terms of specific carbon regulation at the federal level. The president has just said that he was gonna pull together a workshop of meeting of some kind to talk about what to do next. But as I said, again, we're, we, we slid back to very, very nascent stage of specific proposals. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about cap and trade programs for the entire country, but I don't see any of them as moving forward right now. So what's significant really is um, what's going on at the state and regional levels, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to cover the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, how many people know what that is? Just to give me a sense of, okay, so I'll kind of start from scratch on that. Um, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, finally called REGI, which I worked on for a long time with Doug Foy. Um, uh, and I'll explain how that happened. Um, the California work that's going on, which they just launched a cap and trade program um, under their very um, muscular AB32 program, which really is an all sector program, extremely well done in California. We'll see how it goes, but it's looking very good. Um, some, some initiatives that were started that I'll, I'll talk about, um, only because I think they're indicative of what hasn't worked. Um, and then a new program called NA2050, which is a new initiative by the states, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, and the Climate Registry and some other programs. This is just a state's overview. Um, the, um, you know, this is not the first time that states have led. <coughs> um, it's not infrequent that we can't reach uh, agreement on how to proceed um, on something at a national level. We're a big country. Uh, and so it's not infrequent that the states actually start and that after the states have provided some political support, have demonstrated some policies and have demonstrated some programs. I look at healthcare, for example, where you know having Massachusetts have done health have done the healthcare program, um, or whatever, you know, a lot of controversy, but at least there was something to start with there. Uh, and I think it's probably true with climate change programs as well, that um, it's sort of a landing place for implementation. People can start and see how it works, and uh, that at least has been the thinking around federal programs. Um, it makes a difference, actually. I mean, the state's emissions are high. And uh, this is looking at some of the larger countries' emissions uh, compared to our states. 
So the whole sort of west coast is equal about to the UK. Um, you, can, you can see what's here. The red line that's, that encompasses a number of areas is, is China, which is our the second biggest <coughs> um, um, and uh, we've done a number of, we, we do a lot of projects across the Northeast, um, one in particular that I'll be talking about later, which covers the states from Maine to DC, and that those emissions are equivalent to about uh, the UK or um, France. It's, it's an area that actually makes sense to work with. It's, we're fairly small states in the Northeast, we have fairly common sets of interests in the US, and our emissions are high, like Canada's or places. Um, Massachusetts um, our emissions are equivalent to many other countries. And so, you know, when you begin to break it down and look at all the countries that there are in the world, that actually makes sense if you think at the state level. Um, this is just, okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of visuals here. You don't have to learn what any given state is. I just want to kind of show you what the dynamics are of where our emissions come from and what the state um, situations are like. Um, this is uh, greenhouse gas emissions in total tons. So, this is sort of the problem in total tons across the country. So a lot of the Midwest and the Far West, you know, big open spaces, not very many people. Um, their total tonnage is not very high compared to California or Texas, which has a lot of industry and refining and is, is fairly intensive. And then that big swatch in the middle of uh, uh, those darker states, sort of all through the Midwest, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and then all the way out to Illinois. High emissions, um, but then if you look at what the emissions are per capita, so you've already now done this is per person. Um, I think you begin to see how some of the politics of climate change, because if you look at per capita emissions, um, the two coasts where we've gotten most of the work done on climate change it are actually our emissions are lower. So when you look at the potential for those states to get some kind of benefit out of the program, it's because if everything was laid equally down based on per capita emissions, we would probably do well in those programs. And a lot of the, a lot of climate politics is really around who's going to benefit from it. Places like North Dakota or um, Utah are going to fight like crazy because they are going to lose a lot. They have uh, new mining, they have coal, they have natural gas now, some oil, um, and they have very high per capita emissions, not even including those. Um, this is the other, this is called the meatball map. Um, this is the other one that helps explain climate politics, which is um, those are all the those are all the dark black uh, uh, meatballs are coal plants, uh, sized by their emissions, by their CO2 emissions. Um, the red ones are um, their natural gas, and the blue ones are oil uh, and diesel. And if you look, in fact, I think there's even one meatball that comes out in Massachusetts that we're on, we're phasing out coal in the state. Whether you agree to say it that way or not, uh, we have very few coal plants now, and um, all but one or two of them are going to be phased out. It's actually uh, um, uh, an effort that's, that's going on pretty explicitly. And when you talk to the state about it, they say, well, we're uh, following EPA's rules and, and regulations. We're not actually phasing out coal, but the result may likely be the same, with the exception of the Great Point plant, which will be in, in service for quite a bit longer. It was recently updated. But the Salem power plant is coming out is coming out of service, um, and what, what's replacing it is natural gas plants um, that have been were built in the last over the last 15 years and are a lot cleaner per, per unit of electricity produced. But that map, I think, helps. Ex is, look at California. You know, I think that helps explain a lot about how California can move, um, given it has mostly very clean natural gas plants and imports of, of hydro from the north and from also of power. So you know, this is you know, so the question: Can one little state make a difference? When I worked for the Commonwealth all the time, we were always asked, like, "What are you doing? Like, this is a global problem. Who the hell do you think you are? You know, <laughs> trying to like be a smartass and like ma make Massachusetts great, but like, what difference is it going to make?" And the truth is that um, that Massachusetts was equal is was equal. So it's actually a little bit less now to countries like Portugal, Egypt. Switzerland, Austria, Colombia, or Chile, all countries that signed the protocols, all countries with big climate change programs. And our population and our emissions are about the same. Um, we rank 28th among the states for total emissions, but ninth best in terms of per capita. So we're doing pretty well per capita. It helps us to um, feel like it is potentially something that we could gain from if we were able to set 
a carbon cap or uh, have programs in place that were um, benefiting low carbon, a low carbon economy because we're moving towards one pretty, pretty assertively. Um, the, uh, this is kind of what I said before is the Northeast is, is, is bigger than the UK or Italy in terms of population. Um, you know, this, is an ent this is an area that you can work well with, right? It's a pretty big area, pretty common uh, interest. And, um, and, and so just back to the point about why that's useful because it actually adds up to a lot. It's 62.5 million people. Um, I just want to say that Massachusetts legislature has really taken this seriously, and I think, although I have always had my, my problems with how things are going, um, we do have a really good climate plan. The Global Warming Solutions Project um, is the, the, the big um, legislation that was passed. It's strong, uh, and I think that a lot of the programs that are going um, here are actually helping to evaluate how things are going now. There's, there's some accountability in the system, and uh, I think we'll see we'll see continued good progress on it. Um, just to give you a sense of Massachusetts baseline, it's a little bit old, but um, it's about the same now. So remember, you had the map before. We're a little bit less industry. That makes sense, right? A little bit more transportation, and uh, electricity still is a pro is still a large part of our emissions, but going down. Again, just a snapshot um, to get a sense of it, how it is related to the rest of the country. <coughs> So um, what I find is actually really heartening is that there's a lot going on at the states. And um, so the state action by itself, I'm going to run through a set of maps just to give you a picture of what it looks like. And it's not just democratic states. It's not just the coasts. There are actually a lot of programs that are going on with bipartisan consensus because people believe that these things are actually going to help the economies of a variety of places. The Midwest, for example, is has a really robust wind program. Texas has a really robust wind program. Um, biofuels are being used in a lot of the Midwest with some mixed results in terms of climate change. It's a conversation we can have. Uh, some of the biofuels are not so great for climate change. They're either equal or about the same, but they have pretty big programs. And Massachusetts also has a, as I said, a very good climate plan. These are all the states with climate plans. Um, you see a big kind of empty spot in the middle of the country. You're going to see that in each of the maps. Um, there's kind of a strip down the middle of the country in a variety of areas where there's not a lot happening, but a lot on the coasts. Um, so that's just a, that the, the dark green are the states that have their climate plan completely finished and are implementing. With uh, every time a governor changes, well, one of the problems that we'll flag over and over again is every time a governor changes, if the people aren't firmly behind climate action, the whole program has to be rebuilt. And sometimes there are obviously changes in political wins that don't maintain the progress that the state <coughs> agencies have made or that people have wanted. But largely that is the case. Uh, it's very hard to read. Um, I'm going to skip that. It's too hard to read. Okay. <laughs> this is my other map that I told you. You don't have to read it. It has it's absolutely no reason that I want you to read it. All I want you to see is that there's a lot of checks in those boxes. Um, that runs on the on the left hand side. It's completely illegible. On the left hand side, it states. I wasn't assuming you could read it, but I want you to see that on the, across the top is climate action, a whole variety of policies, and look at how many checks there are. I'm going to go through some of the areas, but it's just it's basically to say that a lot of states are trying something in a lot of areas. Uh, that the big sectors here are climate action, energy sector, transportation, and buildings going across the top. So. Um, you can look at, this is actually on the website, um, the C2ES, which used to be the Pew Center's website, and you can look at it in detail. Um, these are the areas, the jurisdictions that are registering their emissions, that are uh, a part of the climate registry, that are um, have created a system at least, so that their corporations and their entities and often the states themselves can register the emissions that are coming from their, um, you know, from their sources. Uh, a lot of Canada and Canadian provinces are involved. Those little dots include um, uh, Native American reservations that are also involved. Um, again, you see that sort of strip down the middle of the country that's not quite playing with the rest of us, but um, that's an awful lot of jurisdictions to be included um, in this basic agreement. So, you know, there's not, there hasn't been up until recently, now there is, but there hadn't been when this was started. Um, and actually, I was, when I was working for Doug, uh, we, Massachusetts helped to launch this registry and it was because there was no common language for states to use on how to register emissions, how to just how to agree on what was coming out of a power plant, how to agree on what uh, 
fuel use meant. Um, and this registry is a bottom-up approach to creating rules for us. A lot of people are playing. Um, North America 2050 is uh, an interesting new thing to watch. Um, and it essentially uh, pulls together the three regions of the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West Coast um, to try and these states and jurisdictions, includes Canadian provinces, have agreed that they want to move towards a lower carbon economy, and they're setting the bound out pretty far, which makes it easier politically. But um, it's been interesting to watch because uh, just when I thought that everything was dead and that there wasn't going to be like the Tea Party was active, there wasn't going to be a holding push. They a whole new push started to try and pull the states together on a variety of, of things. These are all the uh, members that are part of it. Um, if you can look on the website, it doesn't matter so much except to say, I thought it was very interesting that they didn't want to put themselves on a map. That they, you know, they just politically were not willing to have their, their, their state shown on a map, but they were willing to put this list up. That's fine. Um, there's a lot of silliness to this. But Massachusetts is participating in this, as is most of the Northeast. Um, again, just some images. The, um, the dark blue here is the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which is a requirement that um, a certain amount of the electricity generated and sold, generated and or sold in a state come from renewable sources. And those dark blue um, uh, states, like the darker blue states, are ones that have a renewable energy portfolio standard. That's a lot of states that are requiring renewables to be incorporated. It's not everybody. In this case, you see a big problem with the southeast, but um, you know there's something there. And then the the states that are in purple, that pale purple, are all, have an alternative energy portfolio standard, which is a slightly different definition. Um, so it doesn't have to be renewable; it just has to be something different. Uh, as you'll notice, those are mostly coal states. So they include things like uh, being able to use the gas from uh, coal, um, from coal mine methane recapture, and some things that are not exactly alternative or not exactly renewable, but are have some good climate impacts nevertheless. Um, and then the, the very pale ones, which include you know, in South Dakota, um, just have a renewable or alternative energy goal, but not actually a requirement. So there's not, they don't find companies for not having it, but they are moving towards it. It's not much that includes Oklahoma. It's some, some states that have been really hard to, to capture before. Um, states with, uh, with um, greenhouse gas emissions targets. Um, it's a smaller group, but these are ones with some kind of a legislatively required target, like a real, a real place to shoot for. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm always surprised that there, you know, some of the states that are a little, a little unusual don't always play. And some of the other cases do have some kind of a target that they're moving towards. Um, these are states which uh, a similar map which have a, some kind of an active legislative commission or an executive <coughs> branch um, effort on climate change. Again, just to give you a snapshot. It's not everybody, a lot of people are playing. Um, people have, you know, there is, a, there is more of an awareness now than there have been for a long time. But there's also a lot of fear. Uh, a lot of fear that um, the incredibly strong lobbying and uh, money that's gone um, towards uh, stopping states from this, the, the, uh, the level of organization of, um, of opponents is remarkable and sneaky, and uh, I don't work for government anymore, so I can actually say it. I mean, it's, it's um, I, I've never seen anything like it. I've never even heard anything like it. it, it everything else pales in comparison to the level of um, uh, pressure that has been put on politicians who have taken strong roles on climate change. And I think that that's where it's so important for, for people to be like right there and say, yeah, you, you may be hearing from, and I heard an interesting story on the way in, but basically a, a company was told by a legislator, by, by a, a congressional legislator, an important congressional legislator, um, that if they push too hard on climate change, that, uh, that they, their taxes would go up. You know, that there would be, uh, there would be implications for, for not playing right. And uh, when that happens, I mean, it's, it's shocking. You know, it's shocking if that's happening across our, Government, and that's part of the governance problem. But that's why it's so important for people to be engaged, because we are the ones that vote at the end of the day. And if people, if, if the legislators are getting an idea that there really is going to be support for them if they take strong action, and there's not going to be support for them if they don't, that's really what matters at the end of the day. Right too. Um, 
on the on the regional action, it's I think has been some of the most exciting, and in particular, Reggie, which I want to talk about, and the transportation um, and climate initiative a little bit. Um, and so these are the states that have been involved in designing emissions trading programs. Um, as I said, the Midwest program, the green in the Midwest, is probably not going to go anywhere. Um, it was strongly developed, but then uh, seemingly not um, not going to be carried through. But the blue in the Northeast is going great guns, and it's about to get a lot stronger, I think. Um, and um, I'm going to explain that in a second. And then on the, on the Western Climate Initiative, um, the states and observers, the, the paler orange are observers. Um, these are states that have been working together for a while to grapple with the problem, to look at the different sectors that need um, to be addressed. Uh, and, and California has definitely been leading that work. Um, they would like other states around them to be involved at the same time. I'm going to focus on Reggie right now. Um, uh, it's the thing I have the most experience with. Um, and in uh, 2003, when I was working um, with Doug, or Doug, with uh, under Governor um, Romney, um, in 2003, Governor Pataki then contacted the other governors in the Northeast and asked if we would, as a group, want to develop a program to reduce um, CO2 emissions from power plants. And um, that request was uh, made in part because they just finished an analysis in New York that showed that they were about to phase out a whole lot of old coal plants, and they would actually end up having a lot of emissions to sell. So it wasn't completely, uh, it wasn't completely just a you know a kind offer. <laughs> they could see that economically, back to back to Will's point, they could see that economically they could gain from this. They were about to reduce their emissions dramatically, and they'd like to put this in place before they started phasing out those coal plants. Um, the program was led by New York and Massachusetts and New Jersey largely, but all the states participated and sent staff. All the governors signed a letter back saying that they would either be an active part of it or um, in the case of Pennsylvania, they would participate. And so um, uh, the group worked for, um, for well, almost four years, three and a half years, to put together a program that would cap the emissions from the power plants in the Northeast and um, uh, reduce it over time so that it was a little bit like, I don't even know what cap and trade program is, but it's a little bit like uh, uh, like musical chairs. So you basically, have, you're here, you set a cap below, and then within, underneath that, um, the participants, in this case it's the power plants that are in the, in the region, um, would need to trade allowances, actually in this case, buy allowances to be able to have the right to emit what they were putting up into the atmosphere, and um, this uh, covers a large area. It's 10% of the U.S. emissions are in, in the Northeast. It um, you know, covers a, a big area of, of emissions, um, and it was, it, the, the goal was to stabilize emissions from 2009 to 2014, and then to start a 10% reduction. And at the time, the economy was going very well. Now, because the economy downed had somewhat of a downturn, this ended up being not such a hard thing to do. It looked like it would be extremely hard to hit these goals, but in fact, the economy softened. And so uh, there ended up being um, more of a benefit than was expected, by quite a lot, actually. And so the states are in the process right now of trying to stabilize and to actually reduce the cap. We'll see what happens, but they're very, very likely will reduce the cap and continue that downward trend, taking out the extra allowances that are in the system. Um, from the from the economic downturn, um, the it covers the rule covers all fossil power plants that are over 25 megawatts, um, and uh, is it's been very successful. Um, the um, the interesting thing about it, there's sort of two interesting things as the program <coughs> developed. Um, one is the commitment that uh, the states started out with. A long story, but that they would um, use some of the that they would use some of the revenue. That they, well, let me say back up a second. Initially, the, when this other kind of when this kind of program had been done in the past, the states were given allowances to start with, and then had to start trading. And the big and, and very interesting and new thing about this is that no plants were given allowances by nature. Um, they basically had to go out to an auction, and they had to buy allowances for the first time. So that was quite a different kind of, of model. It was kind of radical at the time. Um, it's still one of the only places in the world that where it's being done like that. 
But what it did is to generate a lot of money to come, that would start to come into the system that could be used for energy efficiency to begin the transition to a lower carbon future. And um, so at the time, we never thought that, it, that the numbers could end up being anything like this. We were very hesitant. The original requirement was that 25% of the consumer benefit, uh, of, of the allowance sales would go to consumer benefit or to energy efficiency or some kind of strategic energy purpose. And we were so hesitant to say that. The states all had to do this program themselves. It was like synchronized swimming. So every state had to go through its own regulatory process. And we agreed as a whole for what, what the basic goals would be. Um, but what it's done is it's um, basically all the money that's gone coming into the auction has gone out for energy efficiency has uh, brought down the overall energy needs. So not only are things getting more efficient, but the whole system is needing less energy to be produced in the first place. Um, and the, the study basically said that one, it was, I'm sorry, the study was just done that looked at Reggie and it said that uh, $1.6 billion in net economic benefits were generated out of this program. It's a lot of money. Um, that came from the program, and that it saved customers $1.3 billion uh, across the whole region, across all those states. Now, that's only a small amount per customer per year, um, but it ended up being for industrial cu customers a little, about $2,500, and for individual customers just about $25. But initially, like the, the, the hype was that this was gonna cost people hundreds and hundreds of dollars, that it was gonna be a disaster, it was gonna bring down the economy of the Northeast. You know, there was a lot of, uh, of hype about it, and um, you know, the, the industry was just up in arms about it. And the truth is, it's actually really gone extremely well. Um, the individual customers may or may not even notice it. Um, there's nothing that they have to do. The companies go out to auction. They know how to do it. They do it online. They go out and buy the allowances. It's a market that's actually allocating allowances in a very efficient way. Companies do really well if they don't need them. So they've, they've started to tighten up their processes a lot to see, like, how can I buy the fewest of these possible? Now, the price of them has been very low, so there's not a huge incentive. And as the market gets tighter, the price will go up, and there'll be more incentive for the companies to run more cleanly. And we did find you know, uh, that the companies had something on the order of 5 to 7% improvement that they could make, actually, in the power plant itself. And then there's a lot of improvements in the system. So, um, the, the assessment is that it's reduced demand for energy and that the 10 states as a whole were able to keep $765 million in the local economy generating new jobs that didn't have to go to buy coal and oil and natural gas from outside of the region. And that is also a good finding because the more money we can keep in the region, the more this is a development project. Um, it's the same thing in, in some other areas. I think that that's, you know, that framework is exactly how Reggie's been thinking of it. So the things to watch right now with Reggie um, is will the states keep working so nicely together? They've been doing very, very well. Massachusetts has been a good leader, uh, as has New York, actually, in, um, in keeping the states together. I should say that um, Governor Christie from New Jersey pulled New Jersey out of the process uh, two years ago um, for really questionable reasons. It was actually working very well in New Jersey. It caused a lot of consternation. It, I don't know, I don't work for government anymore. It looked political to me. He had a meeting with the Koch brothers a few weeks before, and then he pulled out, and um, his uh, staff who met with him uh, for a long time, so they really couldn't find any particular reasons why he was pulling out. It, everything else seemed, um, you know, seemed pretty like it was going well, but uh, that was his decision. So the states have been operating without New Jersey, but to no, to no big problem with doing that. Um, and, uh, and there is a lawsuit, actually, that's going on about that, but I, I think they will be out. Um, so the, the question is, will they, will they tighten the cap? And you know, stay tuned, because you'll see, uh, I think you'll see very shortly that there will be a tightening of the cap, um, that the Reggie states are signaling about sort of where they'll go next um, in terms of expanding to more sectors, and that they may do some engagement and linking with other, other emission trading programs, um, maybe with California, maybe with Quebec, which is setting up its own, maybe with British Columbia. Um, I'll go really fast because I've got two minutes. Um, a ver the same states, the same Reggie states, then created a, a, an effort to try and do something similar in the transportation sector, much more difficult in some ways to do. They've been meeting for um, uh, two, almost three years now, working on a variety of issues around electric vehicles, natural gas vehicles, um, uh, a set of sort of development principles across the states. 
uh, some work on freight and making the freight system more uh, efficient, um, and, and mostly doing like uh, just kind of energy literacy for transportation officials. The transportation officials are not clear that they're responsible for and it's something that uses energy. The energy agencies actually don't work on transportation. They say, well, some transportation's not mine. You know, they really should be called the electricity secretary. It's not the energy secretary. because they don't even deal with most of the other energy uses that are in the United States. But um, this, this effort has been um, going along fairly well. It's using um, the efforts of the staff, very devoted staff people, um, to try and align the energy environment and transportation agencies there are almost 100 uh, staffers who are working together weekly. Uh, they meet on the phone every other week as a plenary, and they meet um, to work on specific issues in the alternate weeks. Um, and it's being, uh, it's actually being organized out of the Direct Town Planning Center. I don't know what this is gonna produce at the end of the day. It, some days I think it's gonna be great, and some days I think it's gonna be nothing. Um, I'm just flagging it to say that, that people are putting energy into continuing to try and find on these very difficult issues ways of uh, supporting each other, of keeping the, the ball rolling, and of coming up with new ways and models of programs that, um, that might actually hit the, hit the mark. Um, so this, uh, this is on the transportation side. So uh, just to say, these are kind of the four areas that they're working on, which is vehicle uh, fuel economy, which is being handled at the federal level, positioning on low carbon fuels, which is a, actually a very good way, especially with electric vehicles, a very, very powerful way, as Bill talked about the kind of energy gains that you get with electric vehicles. Yes, the energy is coming from the power plant, <coughs> and yet they are so much more efficient that it's truly a, a much better a much better system. Um, and then a whole set of things around actual physical development. I don't mean development in the way that you were using it before, but sort of land use, vehicle miles and travel, improving transit, improving pedestrian facilities, improving bikes, um, ways to move uh, at, with lower carbon uh, profiles. And then improving the sort of system in which vehicles are, are operating, operations, um, you know, how much, how, how transit uh, systems are rooted, how buses are rooted, um, actually how the transportation system itself works. Um, and so these things which I just talked about, including things like telecommuting and car sharing and, um, you know, it's, it's a whole long list of things, except a lot of them are getting easier to do as technology gets better. There's a, just an enormous amount of excitement um, around the things that new big data systems can offer and, and actually being able to operate the system and for people to be able to use social networks <coughs> to travel better. Um, so at the end of the day, if those state actions that are already in play happen, um, the business as usual line is that red line. Um, if we only did what state legislators have approved already, that's the green line. If we were to do what the executive orders that the, that the governors have done and the executive program, the, the, uh, those programs and what the state legislatures are done, that's the yellow line. But if all state actions that are currently underway happen, and you know, really happen, fully implemented, that's the blue line. So does it get us to a big reduction? No, it doesn't, it, it, but it does a lot. I mean, that line between the red line and the blue, that's an, actually an enormous amount of reductions. And um, we still need federal programs, we still need federal hard emission standards, we need EPA to step in, we could use a cap and trade program, there's dozens of other programs, many of which are happening at the federal level. But just with this, we can make a very big dent. And the states are doing it. They're, they're pretty committed, uh, by and large, to do that. So I think I'll stop there and um, <coughs>